Good afternoon and welcome to What in the Hell Am I Doing Wrong? I am your host, Jamila B. And before we get started today, I would like to remind you to like this video, subscribe to my channel if you haven't already, and share this video on your social media platforms. Without further ado, I'm going to get started with introducing our guest for today. Today, we have um, Dr. Terry L. Parks with us. And Dr. Parks has been in um, for over 25 years. He has worked with children, adults, couples, and families through such facilities as juvenile centers, group homes, residential treatment facilities, and prisons. Um, he's the executive director of new, a new approach behavioral health. And he began his private practice as a licensed professional counselor in 2015. So welcome, Dr. Parks, to the show today. Thank you, thank you, thank you for having me. Great. Glad to be here. Well, I'm glad to have you here. I've been knowing you for a good while and I trust your knowledge on this topic. So I'm glad that you can be here. So with, with I'm just gonna dive right in. Today we're gonna be talking about how intergenerational trauma can affect future relationships. And the reason why I came up with this topic is because I've been I know a lot of people who have experienced trauma or you know who are victim, you know, of intergenerational trauma and they don't seek help for it. And I think especially in the black community, that's something that's taboo to us. And I want you to touch on that as a licensed um, counselor that you can give some insight to that and why it's so important that we address these issues. Okay. So, um, you know, again, thanks for having and uh, having me here. I want to talk about, you know, what is trauma um, and, and why we don't generationally, you know, historically, have stayed away from um, therapy. Mm -hmm. And so what is trauma? In a nutshell, trauma is just injury, injury to the mind, the body, the soul. That's um, Dr. James Gordon, founder of Center for Mind, Body Medicine in DC. That's what he says, and that's what trauma is. It's just injury to the mind, the body, you know, and to the spirit. And the thing about it is, Jamila, is, is if we live long enough, mm -hmm. we will experience trauma in some way. Nobody gets to go through life without experiencing trauma, wow. you know, and trauma doesn't necessarily mean that it's, you know, like a, a rape or incest or sexual abuse or anything like that. Trauma could be, you know, losing a family member, losing a limb, your eye, arm, something like that. And what we have to realize, too, is that a lot of our day to day uh, things that we try to get done, our daily living kind of runs parallel with trauma. Mm -hmm. You know, if you're dealing with a um, a single mom, um, <clears throat> how am I going to pay this rent? How am I going to pay this mortgage? You know, my, my, my kids got to get in school. They need groceries. They need, you know, or how am I going to pay for college and student loans? All of those things kind of run parallel with, you know, um, trauma. And it depends on where you come from. That can be traumatic for you. You know, when I was in school, there were a lot of kids who were dropping out. There were kids who committed suicide because um, there was credit card debt that, you know, back at when I was coming to school, the credit card companies were just perched on campus. Oh, yeah. A, a yeah give me some a, a slice of pizza and a t-shirt. I got my first credit <laughs> card to discover card with a thousand dollar limit with a piece of pizza and a t-shirt. Yeah. Right. Or you had, <laughs> um, or you had a, what was it, a Frisbee yeah. or a water bottle, whatever. And you went and signed up and that's just what started. So there, um, years ago, the HBO did a special on students who were actually killing themselves because they didn't know how to tell their parents they were in $5,000 worth of debt while they were in college. And so you know, these kids were hanging themselves and doing all of that. And it's just like, wow, what are you doing? You know, those credit card companies, you know, any collector is relentless. And when right. you're a kid, you're 18, you don't know what to do. You don't know how to handle that call. So, yeah, that could be traumatic. Mm -hmm. um, so that's what it is. You know, um, we um, the, the problem. But the problem with trauma, OK, the problem with trauma is that we continue to experience it over and over and over again. You know, and that's one of the inter interesting symptoms of trauma is the reoccurrence. Right. Um, and so that's basically, you know, what trauma is. It's just injury to the mind, the body, and the spirit. Um, but, you know, I want to talk a little bit about the traumatic events or the trauma that we 
as you know, black African Americans, you know, whatever name you want to go by, um, what we have experienced. Okay, and what happens is, and you're going to see how we walk around with trauma based on um, based on what happened to our ancestors. Mm -hmm. we that stuff is passed on. You it know is. What I mean? So you imagine you're out in the fields and this man can just walk up to you, rape you and get up and you keep ha you have to keep going to work right mm -hmm. after that. There's no downtime, no rape kit, no nothing. You keep it moving. Um, right. You're being separated from your family. You're being, um, you, you watch your uh, father get hung, you know, uh, mm -hmm. or you watch someone get, you know, beat or whipped or something like that. So all of that is being ingested and it's getting into our, um, you know, nervous system. But we'll talk a little bit about that later. I want to talk about the history of why we shy away from therapy. You want yeah. to give me some, uh, you know, some well, reasons why you think we uh, shy away from it? Well, I know, you know, historically, Black people, we don't go to therapy. You know, it, it's taboo in our community. And a lot of reasons I've heard is that, you know, we go to God, just go to God, God to ha handle it and here answer everything, not discrediting that at all, but that's usually the, the answer to it. Just pray about it. Or, you know, I've also heard people say, um, you know, they don't want to be stigmatized. And, you know, as black people, we're already labeled, we're already put with, you know, titles on us and always something written about us. So we don't want to have another label added to us as having a mental health issue. And it's right. just this that they say we just don't do we're known for being strong and persevering through anything so technically we're not supposed to have these feelings or you know you know digest trauma it's supposed to just roll off our backs like a duck with water so that's, that's <laughs> how you know what saying. <laughs> right so um and, and a lot of that is right but here's the thing what we got to realize is is that we as black people suffer from some of the same issues that our white counterparts suffer from. Mm -hmm. However, with us, it's a little bit more or to a greater degree because we're dealing with what? Racism, economic disparities, prejudice, you know, all of that's going on. And so like you said before, there is a stigma and a judgment, okay? That um, there's, if, if you, if you, uh, if you have a mental illness, something is wrong with you. Mm -hmm. um, I remember when I was growing up, oh, he just slow. Those are the words yeah. you would hear. He yeah. just slow. Or when a kid is in the uh, classroom jumping and bouncing around, I got something for, you know, I got something for that. And you get home and you get beat, mm -hmm. but he keeps getting beat. Why? Because he got ADHD and he can't sit yeah. down, you know. Yeah. And, and, and here again, too, it's like, we, we didn't come up in an era where you, you know, where somebody thought maybe this ain't the right class for him. Mm -hmm. Maybe he needs to be somewhere else or she needs to be somewhere else where, you know, oh, she just daydream all the time. You know, it's just like, mm -hmm. but her, her dreams are like, wow, look at what she's thinking about, you know, yeah. but those things kind of got pressed down. And so, you know, the reason we don't go is things like, you know, you don't want to be labeled as crazy. You don't want folk knowing, you know, in the black community. You don't nobody want to know. I don't want nobody knowing my business. I right. mean, my my mother would, we could go with my aunt. Don't you be talking my business over there. Don't be. <laughs> That's household business. <laughs> That's household business. Yeah. You're not supposed to do that. Yeah. You know, it's like. No, and I'm I'm just, just, think about when I, the movie Soul Food, when they had the, um, do you remember the uncle who always stayed in the room? Right, the, right. The mentally ill person was always hidden in the back somewhere, or kept, you know, right. or we, or we get, it was just like, whatever. Right. We're not going to address it. Mm -hmm. Right, right. Yeah, and that, and that's true. It's like it's like all black people grew up in a, a house with a, a Vegas, you know, uh, slogan. What happens in this house stays in this house. Yeah. <laughs> You know, that's true. That's true. Yeah, and, and, and it was true. And so you didn't talk your business out there. But, you know, some of the other reasons is like, you know, you're you're embarrassed, you know, oh, she crazy. Oh, girl, you know how she is. She just got all this stuff going on it. You know, that type of thing. Uh, and it's like it's also seen, though, as a sign of weakness. Right. You know, like you mentioned earlier, 
not discrediting, you know, Jesus, the Lord and God. But I love those fans where say, yeah, you can pray to Jesus and have a therapist, too. I and recommend that. You know mm -hmm. what I'm saying? Because faith without works is dead. You know, <laughs> you can get out there and believe all day long. But if you're not doing anything to make stuff happen on your own, you know, what's going to happen for you? So, mm -hmm. you know, we hear things like, you know, um, as far as, as men, you know, you a man. Imagine growing up, you know, prior to, I don't know, the 80s as mm -hmm. a black man. You know what I'm saying? Trying to go to work, trying to, you know, um, deal with getting pulled over like we're doing now, all kind of stuff. That stuff we have to deal with is just like, yo, man up. And that's kind of what the black population has been told, the black community. Man mm -hmm. up. Because back in the day, our parents, we learned that from our ancestors. Mm -hmm. You don't have time to cry. You know right. what I'm saying? Pick yourself up, keep it moving. And the whole time, you, so you just, you, you become this person that's walking around with this suppressed trauma. Yes. And when you can't have proper relationships or don't know how, you don't know why it is. That's because that, uh, that trauma hasn't been addressed. OK. Right. It's, it's, and, and we've always been told to get over it. Yeah. Just get over it. You know, just get over it. Oh, you yeah, ain't got over slavery yet. Yes. Every day you keep reminding us. You see what I'm saying? And because nothing has been done, reparations, nothing. We can't. But right. we can remember the Holocaust and we can remember 9-11 and we can That's remember cool. the Titanic. You know, we can mm -hmm. remember things like that. You know, like, oh, those souls that were lost in the Titanic. Are you talking about the hundreds of thousands of folks that were yeah, in slavery absolutely. for hundreds of years? You know, so, yeah, mm -hmm. absolutely. So, you know, now here's another thing, too. A piece of it is our lack of knowledge about mental health. Is mm -hmm. what keeps you away. Okay. Right. Um, we are in, you know, you and I are in, you know, um, BGLO, Black Greek Letter Organization. Mm -hmm. And so you have a lot of people on the outside that talk, you know, smack about it right. because they don't have the knowledge or the language, right. you know, or they saw school days, you right. know, whatever the case may be. And that's like the hair all in the art. Pretty true. <laughs> what I'm just saying, you know, for the most part, it's like, that's why you go to the smoker interest meeting so you can learn some things, you know what I'm saying? And that's what it is, you know, for us. And so kind of what holds us back is our lack of knowledge, you know, from seeking out therapy. And if you think if you attend, somebody going to call you crazy or you're going to put be sent to, you know, Georgia Regional or, you know, I don't think they exist anymore, but whatever the case may be. I think it's, it, I don't know if it still exists anymore. I'm not sure. We're over there on, in, in Maria Ridgeview. You know, you're going to go to Ridgeview. They're going to put you in a straight jacket or whatever the case may be. Mm -hmm. And, you know, for us, for everyone, we need to get our emotional, our emotional fitness together. Okay. Mm -hmm. Our emotional fitness together. And whether you've had a trauma that's big or small or whatever, it doesn't have to keep on, you know, causing you pain in your life. OK, mm -hmm. after years of the event, because it can be transformational, mm -hmm. you know, uh, it could be a portal to wellness. Right. It, so um, you want me to keep going or you want to ask questions in here or. Um, yeah, I want to I want to um, I don't know if we're going to get to this, but it was a question in the chat. How do we break the stigma in the black community? How do we break that stigma? Of, of, of addressing mental health issues because I do feel like every individual, regardless of how big or small or where you are on the spectrum, we have some level of mental health um, illness, you know? So how do we break yeah. that stigma in the black community? Well, you know, some of the things we just talked about, you have to get educated about. You see what I'm saying? What's going on with you? Um, you know what? People keep telling me that I'm moody or whatever the case may be. Okay, well, 500 people can't be wrong. Let me go in here and check and see what's going on, you know, because I keep having relationships that end bad, you know, mm -hmm. or I have to keep apologizing or we're at this point where we have to, you know, kiss and make up. Right. You get, you get, the, you break the stigma, 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 I'm sorry, by normalizing and saying, hey, I have a problem and I need help. There's mm -hmm. nothing wrong with asking for help. Everyone has asked for help somewhere, sometime in our lives. 
I want to get help for what's going on with me. Now, the 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 tail end of that or the flip side of that, the dialectic is, mm, well, there's nothing wrong with me. I don't feel there's anything wrong with me, you know? Mm -hmm. And so if you feel, you know, like we both know when it comes to domestic violence, if you, you know, uh, what is it? Minimizing, denying and blame. If you denying it, then there's no starting point for change because right. it's like, well, if nothing's wrong with me, then you, we don't know where to start. Right. So it's getting information on, you know, how am I doing today? Am I feeling like, you know, for most part of the weeks I get up and I just want to, you know, or I don't get up. I want to stay in a dark room. I want to stay in the bed. I don't want to go anywhere. I don't want to, you know, um, it, it's like the person, I think they call it, um, I think it's social depression where you go to work and you, you know, people are saying, oh, girl, Jamila, we going out after work, girl, come on. Oh, yeah, we there with time. OK, as soon as I get home, I'm going to check. But you know, and you're not going to go and you go home and you get out your clothes and you put on your robe and you just lay in the bed or you sit back and not do anything. I think they call that. That's the new social depression. OK. You know? And so um, yeah. you have no intention of going. Uh -huh. no intention of going, but you tell everybody you're going to go and you sound excited about it, but you just want to go home and, you know, um, and just relax by yourself. So, yeah, it's getting, you know, we, 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 we kill that stigma by, you know, folks not saying, you know, that person is crazy. All right. So mm -hmm. let me hear to, and, and tell all your listeners. OK, out there, <laughs> there is no diagnosis called crazy. OK, OK, there's no diagnosis called crazy. Mm -hmm. You can take any DSM, look through it front and back. You'll never see crazy in there. There is no diagnosis called crazy. OK. And so therefore, it's better to get help for what's going on with you than rather, you know, rather than getting over it and moving on. And the issue is, too. Now, here's another thing, because I have clients that do this to me. I always tell them. Therapy only works if you want it to. That's true. Only works if you want it to. Because I will have people come to me, they'll gripe and they'll complain. And then when you start hitting them with certain things and you, you know, hey, you got to be accountable. You know, all of a sudden they're canceling appointments. You don't see them anymore. You'll call and just say, oh, yeah, you know, I just got a lot going on. I'm going to wait for a while. And I'm like, OK, you know, um, I'm concerned about you. I think maybe, you know, and you're doing that. And you say, yeah, this person doesn't want help. They right. want to be where they are and they're going to blame everybody else for what's going on with them. OK, exactly. So I wanted to bring this up, you know, mm -hmm. on my platform is what in the hell am I doing wrong? You know, we talk about dating and how things go on in relationships. And a lot of people have experienced childhood trauma, you know, trauma mm -hmm. from um, experience with a domestic violence parent of domestic violent parents or, you know, they've been in a home that they've experienced some kind of um, sexual violence or domestic violence. How do people who have experienced that level of trauma continuously in their life as a child and they develop into an adult, never got these issues addressed? How do they have successful and productive relationships? OK. That's a good question. I'm glad you asked it. Mm -hmm. I sound like a politician right there, don't I? <laughs> I'm glad you asked it. Uh, <laughs> okay. So, um, all right. So I got my little thing here, my my brain. Your brain, okay. Uh, That's my brain, <laughs> you know, and I'm going to open up my brain. So this mm -hmm. is your nervous <laughs> system, okay? This okay. is your nervous system, okay? Mm -hmm. Now. And there's and we'll talk about the different, you know, there's different techniques for helping with trauma, you know, somatic, you know, um, um, what is it, somatic learning or, you know, brain spotting or, you know, um, EMDR, I believe it is. Yeah. Those different techniques for yeah. dealing with it. But OK, so this is what happens. And I'm going to bring up, you know, um, talk a little bit about R. Kelly to help people understand you know him, okay so what happens is um um so like i said trauma is this you know totally unique experience okay um when someone uh when they're traumatized uh it happens to someone we're in the nervous system this is it right mm -hmm. here and its capacity to process this 
the incident gets overwhelmed. Okay. Mm -hmm. It gets overwhelmed and pieces of that experience are left behind. Mm -hmm. Okay. Frozen in the brain. Okay. So when the flow of energy hits those spots, Jamila, mm -hmm. we have what you call someone experiencing trauma symptoms. Okay. Right. Now I'll give you an example. Let me break this down. And uh, when I was mentioning brain spotting before, that's Dr. David Grand. He helped folks with Sandy Hook and 9-11 okay. and the whole nine. Okay. And he developed uh, brain spotting. Okay. And so you think about this. All right. So here you are, this, you know, uh, you got this, this um, tabula rasa, which I think is Latin for, you know, blank slate. You know, okay. I'm going back to my psychology 101. I'm giving your audience, you know, this for free, which took me thousands of dollars to learn. <laughs> I know, because I'm like, what are you supposed to talk about? <laughs> okay. So when we're born, we have this tabula rasa, you know, which means, you know, blank slate. And um, what happens is, is when trauma hits this, okay, when trauma hits that brain, like I said, it's there. It's, 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 it's frozen. Now, what happens? You grow older. You see what I'm saying? Physically. But guess what? Those pieces, remember what I said, are left behind, frozen in the brain. So when energy hits those spots, you experience trauma. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you, you, you go out on a date, you know what I'm saying? And somebody says something that you don't like or whatever, that's something that has been left behind. And guess what? It could have been something that was left behind with mom or dad. Wow. Not necessarily a past romantic relationship. Okay. So when we talk about this, let's take it for instance. R. Kelly was being sexually abused by his sister. Okay. So we're talking to seven to nine year old, you know, being forced to do things with a 16 to 19 year old. Mm -hmm. Okay. So now what happens is people want to want to throw R. Kelly under the bus. And I get it. I get it. But you always got to remember what's making this person do this. Nobody wakes up one day and decides, you know what? I think I want to be a pedophile. I think I want to be a rapist. I think I want to be a murderer. That doesn't happen. There is some trauma, some things that have happened that went unresolved. There was It, it wasn't Ted Bundy. I'm trying to remember who the serial killer was. But quickly... What his mother did, his dad was away in the war. Mm -hmm. And so mom would entertain other men because she had needs while dad was gone. Right. And so the son would see these men coming in mm -hmm. and mom would do her thing. And then she would beat him mm -hmm. after make him read scripture in the Bible that talked about wayward women and whatnot. So when he got older, he began to kill prostitutes. Because that's how he saw his mother. Mm -hmm. You see what I'm saying? And she would say, you know, this is bad. This is bad. But you're doing it. You see what I'm saying? Mom, you're doing it. So what happens is with R. Kelly, he's being traumatized. Mm -hmm. by his, what am I supposed to do? And not only her, I think there were other people, too, you know, uh, who got a hold of him. So now what happened? R. Kelly gets older. Right. He gets older. Now he gets money. He gets fame. But guess what? Those pieces are what? Left behind, frozen in the brain. So then when he starts to talk, see, everybody, no, no, no one ever questioned, why is it R. Kelly is talking to these young girls? Because he's stuck in that. Frozen yeah. in that era when it happened. See, the, where is my front part? Okay, so here is the frontal, prefrontal lobe. That is the decision-making part of the brain. Mm. You see what I'm saying? Here is the amygdala which is what? The emotion part of the brain. What happens is, is when there's anger or frustration or you got all this stuff going on, you got too much to think about, blood is drained from the decision-making part of the brain into the amygdala, which is the emotion part of the brain. And then you, you uh, react out of your emotion mind. That's when your thoughts and behaviors are primarily driven by your current emotional state. Mm -hmm. So Mila go buy a pair of shoes because she's trying to go out to this event and she go in here and go, I just need one pair of shoes and come out with five pair. Uh -huh. The decision making has been clouded and it has moved to her emotion. Oh, they got a sale, girl. Oh, I like these. I like these. these or whatever. And so that's what happens. 
Why do you think women, when they're married to their husband, they ask a lot of things right after, you know, sex, intercourse? That blood has been drained. Your decision making ain't the same. <laughs> He's like, yeah, babe. The next thing you know, you wake up, you're like, how we get a new car? Well, you said I can go buy one. What you talking about? You don't ask me that one. <laughs> because all of the blood has been drawn out of decision making. So let's get back to R. Kelly. R. Kelly, his rap game, mm -hmm. he don't have to worry about older females. You see what I'm saying? Why? Because they're going to flock to him. He got the money. He got the fame. He got the car. It's the young girls he got rap game for because that's where his mind is. Yeah. We all have. I, I got some friends, luckily they ain't watching this. We growing up used to say, <laughs> Oh, why are you always interested? Yeah, she gonna she gonna be nice when she get older. Why are you looking at her now? We are older. No, yeah. leave the young girls alone. Something and I didn't know that then, but after learning this, I'm like, man, something he was always angry, always fighting. Huh? Go ahead. But let me ask you this. Okay, speaking of that, okay, I've heard, I've seen men, I, I recall watching, looking on um, Instagram, and it's, it's these twins that are on there, the McClure twins, and this guy, I mean, these are little girls, and this guy was saying the same thing you said, your friend would say, they would see, the, see them like, oh, I can't wait till they get older, mm -hmm. and they're going to be this and that, I will date them. For somebody's mind to even go to looking at a child, and then, you know, envisioning them as an adult date. Do you think that person can be can be um, treated? Do you think they can be, you know, I don't know if I would say, I don't want to say um, cured, but do you think that that mindset can change once they've experienced some level, like the R. Kelly trauma? R. Kelly said some real twisted stuff. Like he would say things like he, you, his mom used to um, drink a cup of coffee from McDonald's and her lipstick would be left on mm -hmm. the cup and yeah. he would like to go behind her and lick. I mean, that's, that's some sick stuff. So how, right. a person like that who's experienced like sibling incest type, you know, relationships mm -hmm. and stuff, how do you kind of transform that person? Is it even possible? And I mean, well, through you you know, know. Some things I'm, I'm, I'm talking about, you know, through brain spotting, through um, through brain spotting and through, um, you know, somatic. Um, I can't. What is the name of that? Let me double check my stuff here. Somatic experiencing. That's when somatic is when, you know, you, you ever hear somebody say, you know, man, that's psychosomatic. It's all in your mind. It's all mm -hmm. Somatic experiencing is when there's trauma. There's a book out and I'm trying to remember uh, the doctor's name who wrote it, but it's called The Body Keeps the Score because your body is always your body gets traumatized, too. You ever mm -hmm. notice when a parent is yelling at a kid and they raise their hand and the kid jump? You yeah. see what I'm saying? It's like their body has experienced that. It's locked in. So you, you know, you decrease it from the body. You have to decrease it from the brain. You have to get it out. And so through all of those different techniques, yeah, trauma can be transformational. It doesn't have to be. But here's the thing. What he's doing is, remember, and people can argue this with me or not, all behavior is learned. Right. How did you learn how to ride a bike? How did you learn how to skate? How did you learn how to somebody taught you that? That's what I said. You didn't wake up, come out the womb and learn how to skate. You didn't wake up learning how to ride a bike. You know, it was already it wasn't already put there. So you had to learn it. So when R. Kelly is saying, you know, oh, you know, I had to put my lips where, you know, where my mom was or whatever. That's like, you know what? He really valued and loved his mother. Yeah. We like, yo, that's kind of crazy. It's sick or whatever the case may be. What's making him do that? What would make R. Kelly, you know, say that or whatever? And, then, you know, we're, we're going to hear, you know, uh, uh, bits and pieces. We're not going to get the full. You know, we don't know. Was mom doing something? You know, what was the deal? And so here, here's, here's my point. And the same thing with Michael Jackson. You see what I'm saying? It's just like, yo, why he always want to be around kids? Oh, because they're innocent and they're this and that. No, that's where that man is stuck. That's where they're stuck. And so you look at. Um, the, it, here's the one thing you don't, you have to ask yourself, if it happened to R. Kelly, then who did it to his sister? Right. See what I'm saying? Because she's doing that to him. 
It had to come from somewhere. Remember, she was parentified at a very early age. Mom right. had to work at night, so she's now the parent. She's taking care of what, what did the brother say? If he got held in, he knew it was gonna happen to him and Robert went out to play. If Robert held, got held in, he went, you know, was out to play. So she was just basically picking and choosing who she wanted to do these things with, you know? And so when we look at this whole, um, you know, um, trauma, when he's around, now I got money and I got this, and you're looking at these little girls because you haven't got any treatment and your mind is stuck there with them because I can control them like my sister controlled me. And I can have them do anything I want them to because I know they're going to do it because of. You see what I'm saying? And so with that, you know, he experienced inter intergenerational trauma. OK, now. Now we move to intergenerational trauma. I think that's something that you want. I'm sorry. I hope I answered the question. <laughs> I was just wanting to know, like, if, if someone has experienced this stuff and they move on to be married or be in a relationship, how can they be? Because, OK, a person like R. Kelly, if I were a woman married to a man like R. Kelly, I would be concerned about if I had children. You know, like, I mean, mm -hmm. I would be concerned about that or if. Um, a man has, or a woman has experienced domestic violence in their in their childhood or in their life. You know, do they perpetuate that same behavior in their adult relationships? You know, how do you how do you address those things? And if you are in a relationship with someone and you identify those things, how do you coach them to go and get help or to try and help them through that situation? Yeah. So a lot of times, by the time people get married and are <laughs> excuse me in uh, long lasting relationships, you almost are kind of like at a point where they're, you know, too far gone. Mm -hmm. okay? What happens is, is that, like I said before, the person has to want to heal. Right. Okay? And they know what they're doing is wrong and they're fighting against it and they're trying to, you know, oh, I can't take this. I'm not, you know, I don't want to be this way. But, you know, it's like, uh, who was the movie? Um, New Jack City, they calling me Mookie, they calling me, you know, all of this stuff is, is calling this person. And it's like, I don't know why I do what I do. I don't know why. And so um, with a lot of my clients, when I hear what's going on with them, I said, it's because of, because of trauma. And they start thinking like, well, what are you talking about? Nothing happened to me. And I'm just like, yeah, it did. And when I start breaking down what happened in their relationship, you know, there's tears flowing in the whole nine because all of our mental health issues are related at our from trauma. They're rooted in trauma. So how do you get this person to, to, to a therapist? How do you get them? You know, I, I, I see it like this. I'm going to pretend like my brain is my car now mm -hmm. traveling down the road and you dating or whatever, and you meet somebody and then they have what they call them red flags. I call them their yeah. sign. And the sign says the bridge is out. Well, you know what? I still like him. You know, we, you know, um, it, it's just difficult for him right now. And I understand couples going to argue in the whole night. So you keep on driving and you see another sign that says, I said the bridge is out. Well, you know what? He's on, he, he uh, proposed and we're going to get married and everything is going to be cool when we have a baby, stop moving together and start, you know, paying everything. It's going to be lovely. And you keep driving. And then the next sign says, proceed at your own risk. Mm -hmm. And so you do it and you're trying to get across to the other side to marriage and whatever, because you think in marriage and babies and all of that is going to save you. Right. But you fall short and then you down there in relationship hell being skewered and turned around. And everybody's like, you saw this before you got married right. in every situation, every situation. People see things at the beginning that they, well, shoot, it's been a long time. I ain't been with nobody. You know, we just going to work this out. And mm -hmm. I'm trying to get down the aisle and I need a ring and I need to be Mrs. So-and-so or whatever. And so you put all of that warning. So I was like, wait a minute, you know, nah, dude, he kind of get upset and he done grab me by the neck or wait, he got some weird stuff when it comes to his intimacy, some things he want to do. I don't know about that. What's going on? You need to pump the brakes right there. You need to go to marriage. Uh, I mean, couples therapy mm -hmm. and just hit it all. And I'm not saying go see your pastor. I'm not saying don't see him either. I'm saying get you somebody who's licensed in the art because most pastors 
practice outside of their documentable competency, which they'll, <laughs> which, which they'll end up doing. I'm just going to be frank about it. Yeah, that's that's true. Coming from a book that's very patriarchal and mm-hmm. basically tell you, you need to submit. You need to do what that man's saying. And you're like, what? Okay. Mm-hmm. Question. You yep. got to in your face, I can tell. <laughs> That is true. So and when it comes to um, situations of domestic violence, right? Mm-hmm. Okay. In your work, working with um, a lot of perpetrators of domestic violence, do you see that many of them, they've experienced it in, the, in their childhood or in their lives, you know, coming up, they experienced some level of domestic violence? Yeah. Um, most, uh, mo- well, here, let me let you in on a big secret. <clears throat> and this was, you know, um, when I and Dr. White was talking about. In my classes, mm-hmm. domestic violence is a relationship about power and control. Right. It's a relationship about power and control. Someone is trying to gain power and control over someone else. Okay. Mm-hmm. And so we know what that looks like, you know, economic abuse, minimizing dying and blaming, um, coercion and threats, emotional abuse, using the children, all that type of stuff. The majority of mine, and I should do research on it, probably when, you know, they open outside back up. Mm-hmm. The majority of Caucasian white folks that come to class, it's all about power and control. Mm-hmm. Spanish, power and control. Asian, power and control. You see a pattern, power and control. Black, she was going through my phone and saw some pictures. Mm -hmm. Fighting, you see what I'm saying? About getting caught. Mm -hmm. Every, I'm like, so it wasn't over no money. No, man, she went through my phone, she was going. Now, of course, I can make it a domestic violence deal, but that's the basis of. And so you ask them, so did you witness this growing up or whatever? Well, my dad wasn't around. But my grandma and grandfather used to fight, you know, so they saw it somewhere, you know. Mm -hmm. But a majority of people, like I said, all behavior is learned. Where do you learn to do that from? See, if there have been people who have called me for domestic violence and say, hey, I noticed you're a therapist. Can I just do therapy instead? This is men and women. Can I do therapy instead? And I said, well, if we did, that would suggest you were born with that behavior. And you weren't. You learned that behavior. So now we're going to educate you on what's healthy and what's unhealthy. Mm -hmm. So, yes, to answer your question in a roundabout way, yes, the majority of people that come in have experienced that and saw that somewhere. Okay. And I'm going to jump to this topic right quick, I want to address it. When we're talking about intergenerational trauma, and then we go back to slavery and, you know, how generations of Black women have had to endure rapes, um, children being taken away from them, all types of horrible things that you can't even imagine today happening to Black women. And then today when Black women have this level of defense up or they're, they're perceived as being angry, do you feel that that stems from this intergenerational trauma that we've experienced over the years, like what we're conditioned to do and how we are conditioned to behave? Yeah, I think that, um, you know, and I got to be careful here. Yeah, I, I don't like that narrative. So that's why I'm being careful. But I've read um, stuff where, you know, they, you know, they attribute a lot of, you know, what they say us to be angry or a lot of the aggression that we have that they say, and I don't ever want to say black women are aggressive, black women are angry. Cause I just think that we're just existing and living and getting through life. But a lot of things that we've experienced does contribute to how we move in the world. And mm-hmm. I think that part of our history is very relevant to how we behave. So, yeah. Mm-hmm. So let's look at the hierarchy. Okay. Mm-hmm. Let's go back. White American, you know, people can see my white American male. Mm -hmm. Okay. The overseer. White women. Mm -hmm. Black men. Black women. You see what I'm saying? So Mm -hmm. look at all of these people that she has standing on her neck. You see what I'm saying? All of these layers 
that she has to go. So everybody telling her what to do and how to behave and how to act or whatever. And then you have the black man who's coming in and who's what learned his behavior from where? The white man. The white man. Mm -hmm. So you said, woman's supposed to be doing this and da 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 da. You know, and so you hear that. And 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 here's my my take on that. I think what has happened is that we have been so marginalized and so oppressed that women are pulling and saying, you know what, I, I got to fight to get from under this. I got to fight to do with, you know, and so you, you appear angry, but think about it. If you've had to deal with, you know, issues at home as a young girl, right? Okay. Issues at home, uncles, cousins, somebody trying to touch you or whatever the case may be. You told your mama, it was like, well, what did you do to make him do that? Huh? Right. What did I do? You know, um, so you get blamed. So then you decide, okay, I'm gonna shut up. I ain't gonna say nothing. So now you got issue with that person and you got issue with your mom. Right. You see what I'm saying? Because she didn't protect you or somebody didn't protect you. So I gotta hide that. Then you get older, whatever. Maybe somebody trying to, you know, um, uh, attack you in, in school or you get to college and maybe something. And so you start building this wall of protection. Mm -hmm. You see what I'm saying? And yeah, I don't know how to deal with it because my trauma has not been addressed. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I'm going to be mad. Nobody's asking me how I'm feeling. Nobody asking me what happened to me when I was nine and how did you deal with that? And I was not able to, you know, to, to process that. And so since I don't process it, appropriately it comes out as anger and rage and frustration because it's like you're underwater screaming and nobody can hear you exactly you know it's just like uh, you know you got your hand you know it's like that that dream you have where it says somebody's you know like sitting on top of you and you trying to scream and you can't mm -hmm. yeah I had almost one of them last night after watching them <laughs> oh please don't mention that we watched it before <laughs> i watched it when it first hit um what is it on? It's on Amazon it's on Prime or um, yeah, I think it's on I Prime. I binge watched it one weekend, and this is before people were like talking about it on social media, and I literally felt traumatized watching that. My mom was like, "Who created this?" Because I, I mean, something in their mind. How could you come up with something like this? But in reality, sometimes it's scary and in fiction. And I mean, even though they put a different spin on it, these mm -hmm. things actually happen. And just to watch how. The mother was reacting throughout this movie and how, you know, how their mind was bothering them so much due to the trauma that wow. they experienced. And I mean, a lot of people were saying that, you know, um, Lena Waite, the, the, one of the um, creators of this project, how she was playing into the narrative of traumatizing black people or re-traumatizing black people. Sometimes those things need to be addressed because it yeah. is reality. You know, it's reality. But I, I ain't gonna lie, I was traumatized watching it. I really was. It was yeah. very. I um, you know, I think I'm up to season one, episode seven. And what people don't realize is, yeah, I know I got a lot to go. But what people don't realize is, is like they thinking like subprime lending just started in 2008. Man, what are you talking about with the redlining? And you see how they sat at the table and did the right. bank deal with the. I'm like, wow. Okay, it's but anyway, those things it's like those um, inequalities or the unfairness that was already put in place for us that we didn't even stand a chance. You know what I mean? Like day one, yeah. mm -hmm. sixteen hundred from day one. You see yeah. what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So yeah, and and if you want to. Get even more angry. Watch um, on what is it? Uh, HBO um, Max. Exterminate all the brutes. Yeah, I might. I have to take that those. One will be you. 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 Yeah, it, it, you will watch that in parts. But anyway, so let's talk about this intergenerational trauma. What is intergenerational trauma? You know, that's a behavior pattern. Sorry, I'm looking out here, my dog. That you know we can pass on to our kids without knowing. Okay, that's mm -hmm. what it is. And so. Uh, Diane Poole Heller, she talks about attachment, okay? She talks about attachment when we're dealing with intergenerational, you know, trauma. So what is secure attachment? You know, you have some people who never detach from parents, you know, when they leave the house or whatever. It's like, 
my lord, man, they just constantly they own their parents. It's like every time you turn around, the parents still helping them out. You know, they all out of college and all working, and their parents still helping them out with credit and all kind of stuff and everything you're going to do. And you married and you got kids, and it's like everything is still over there. You know, mm -hmm. the leave and cleave never happened. Okay, right. so when we talk about um, we talk about secure attachment. Okay, so this happens. You know, uh, uh, with the process of maternal bond, uh, um, uh, bonding. This is what you know Diane uh, Poole Her is talking about. You know, like when a newborn experience, you know, what is called a safe haven. Okay, mm -hmm. so we want to clear the safe haven. Safe haven is when someone looks at you with that look of you know love. They make an eye contact, you know, and they know you, you know, uh, you special to them. All right. Yeah. So, whatever, what what else helps with secure attachment? Tone of voice, the nurturing, you rubbing somebody's feet, they back, they legs, you know, all that kind of stuff. You brushing their hair, all of that makes for good bonding. But what happens is, in many cases, you don't get that. A lot of us don't get that. And so, right. what happens is that results in a level of insecurity. Okay. What is insecurity? Insecurity is based out of uh, myth and fear. It's based out of myth and fear. So if I say, you know, you hear Jamila talking with her friends, not that Jamila would say this, but all oh, men are dogs, you know, the, 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 the what's the myth? The myth is all men. What's the fear? I got a man at home, so he must be a dog. You see what I'm saying? So your insecurities, you have a, oh girl, he's so insecure. It's based out of myth and fear. Oh, you're cheating. So I'm cheating. So you must be cheating. That's mm. the myth. You see what I'm saying? And the fear is you cheating on me because I'm cheating on you. Okay. So when we um when when that that uh, se uh secure attachment doesn't happen, you know, it results in a trauma at a deep level, very deep level. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um and so unless we address it, it can cause issues throughout our life that can be passed on to our kids. OK, imagine, you know, our ancestors having to pass that on. I ain't got time for you. You know, yeah. I got to get out here in this field, throw you on my back, stop all that, hush all that crying. You know, I can't sit down here. And, you know, and so you do that. So what happens is, is that this connection is very important because it actually decreases a positive, the possibility of having traumatic symptoms in your life if there's a secure bond from the beginning okay and so we have this built-in nervous uh resiliency that our body call our nervous system in the brain as i said before you know mm -hmm. when we have good connection and it takes us when we have that good connection it takes us to a level of health that supports our immune system and protects us from trauma reactions later now here's the deal it doesn't mean that if you have a life-threatening event you won't be stressed out. But those with a secure attachment recover faster because of the way the brain is shaped and the way the nervous system regulates due to the attachment. And, so, and it's, oh, go ahead. <laughs> well, I'm just thinking when you're talking about the secure attachment, this takes me back to, um, this takes me to DMX, for example. I don't mm -hmm. know if it's relevant or not. Everybody knows that there's only a handful of rappers, and I literally mean that, that I, I was a fan, I'm a fan of, and he's one of them. So I think back to, you know, his childhood and, you know, the relationship with his mom and not really having that secure attachment mm -hmm. with her. And I feel like that manifested itself into like his destruction later in life with drugs and all that type of stuff. So those are some of the things that people can get into due mm -hmm. to this type of trauma, you know, being abandoned and being unloved, you know? So right. yeah. And, I, and, it, and it's good. You talk about, cause we're going to talk about that. So you ahead of me, but yeah, <laughs> you, you, you thinking that, you know, think about it. This, this person that you supposed to have a secure attachment with takes you to a, a children's home and say, we're going to visit and leave you. You know right. what I'm saying? You're like, what? You know, and there were a lot of parents that did that to kids in those, you know, in those days. So let's talk about it. Okay. Let's talk about when secure attachment doesn't happen. Okay. Mm -hmm. When it doesn't happen. Now, you would get three types of, you know, um, people. You have avoidant attachment. Now, what is avoidant attachment? Avoidant attachment is like a child is left alone too much 
or gets rejected when they try to make contact. Mm -hmm. Okay. And so now when I'm saying this, I want you to think about, you know, you know, situations of people you may know and be like, hmm, that could be it. OK. And so as an adult, these people tend to be loners or have a hard time interacting with others because they didn't get that. And they try to reach out, mama, dad, hey, get away from me. Boy. I ain't got time for that. You know, go on, get off me. Mm -hmm. Then you have what's called ambivalent attachment. OK, mm -hmm. now, what is ambivalent attachment? Yeah, you may have had some pretty good love coming from a parent, but it was inconsistent. Right. So say you had a parent who maybe was addicted to substances. You know what I'm saying? It's like, oh, I love you. It was my baby or whatever. But then you turn around and you sell their PlayStation or you sell their belongings or whatever. And it's just like, hmm. They say they love me, but then they're doing things that. And so as an adult, these people focus excessively on the fear of being betrayed or abandoned. Mm -hmm. And they have difficulty trusting a relationship for fear that it may go away. Right. OK. Then you have disorganized attachment. All right. Now, this could be the one disorganized attachment. This could be DMX's mom. Mm -hmm. In this situation, the parent has unresolved trauma or is scared themselves or they're doing scary things in the relationship. Mm. So the child experienced the parent who's supposed to be the safe haven as a source of threat. Mm -hmm. As adults, these type of people will make a connection, but then they sabotage it because of some unexplained fear that arises. Mm -hmm. Ooh, I see you bobbing your head. Okay, so. <laughs> <laughs> as babies when we're babies that attachment is connected to attachment is connected to our survival right. anybody who took uh psychology 101 no it wasn't psychology 101 it may have been um but i think i took it in behavior modification there were these two there was a study done where they took these two primates these two baby monkeys and stuck them in a cage one had a live mother and one had a fake mother that was made out of mesh and wire mm -hmm. over time what do you think happened with these two different monkeys? Well, I mean, the one with the fake mother died right. because there was no connection. And they have pictures of the monkey hanging on to this mesh thing and it's not giving any love back. It's just there. You see what I'm saying? So mm -hmm. as babies, that attachment is connected to our survival. Mm -hmm. When you don't have that, like, you know, and, and so we're thriving. But when a child doesn't have that or fails to thrive, it's called morasmus. Morasmus means failure to thrive. OK. Mm -hmm. And so whoo, we're going way back in my psych notes. <laughs> OK. <laughs> uh, we are dependent on our caregivers to provide good connection. So mm -hmm. when we have an attachment issues underlying them is what? Our survival instinct. Mm -hmm. OK. One way that we transmit culture and our own family dynamics is through our parenting style. Mm -hmm. Our parenting style. Now, well, dang, Dr. Parsh, this just sounds horrible. How can we get back to secure attachment? You can get it back. You can get that attachment back. Okay. And that's now, good to know. <laughs> yeah, if you're lucky to you know, be born in a family without secure attachment, you can get it back. You know, without blaming your mom and dad, because what this happens culturally and generationally throughout the world. OK, but your mom and dad can't help the template they was dealt. Right. You know what I'm saying? And so. But once you become more aware of that, Jamila, you know, there are like a myriad of opportunities to change that. One of them, of course, being therapy. OK. And so secure attachment can be learned later in life even if you didn't get it from birth so one now this is going to be for all the folks listening out there you really want to listen to this if you married or you living with somebody <laughs> jacking up like the church folks say anyway if you got some nice stress in your life it says in your marriage the welcome home hug the welcome home hug how many people do a welcome home hug 20 to 30 seconds or whatever it takes you to what co-regulate each other mm -hmm. Woo, jamila girl come here i miss you today i've been gone mm. 
I could wait till I get home. Girl, smell good in here. What you, you know, 20, 30 seconds, not, man, get away from me. I'm trying to cook around this flame or whatever. You see what I'm saying? So that right there kind of pushes away. Co-regulate each other, okay? Co-regulate each other. The second one is while you're out at a party or whatever, we had an event. I'm looking at Jamila across the room like, girl, you fine. I just <laughs> want to with you, man. I like that lipstick and that, what is that, Delta Delta Crimson? Is that what you <laughs> that what you wearing on the night? Yeah, I like that. You know, I can't wait till we get home. You know what I'm saying? That look when you get somebody across the room, they stand at you and y'all already married. You're just like, man, girl, you looking good. You're looking good before you left and now we over here. Okay. That really nourishes your bond. Right. That really nourishes your bond. Then being protective. Now, this is very good. Being protective of each other while you are in public and not speaking disparagingly about one another. And when right. you, you know, when you're together and being a safe person to be around, we've all experienced it. There's a cookout. And you're like, oh, here they come. You yeah. know, they've been arguing in the car. You know, as the old folks say, they just arguing, arguing, <laughs> you know. And as soon as they get in, hey girl, how y'all doing? We bought some potato salad and whatever. So the dude grab a brew, he out there with the fellas at the uh grill, the women in the kitchen, and just girl, I just can't. We got into it again coming over. I just he just, you know, I can't stand him with his old insecure self and blah blah blah. Speaking disparagingly. Now everybody's in your business. Mm-hmm. See what I'm saying? And then when you need help or whatever, you can't get it because you told it to certain people. And then the fourth one is, here's another one, and I like this one, is playing is another way to get back that secure attachment. We work too much in society. We constantly on the go. You see what I'm saying? Play brings us back to secure attachment, and it refreshes our spirit and connects us to what we really like to do, and that's healing in itself. Yes. Ooh, I'm seeing all kinds of questions pop up here. Yeah. I, 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 when you finish that, I want to answer some of these. I've let some pass by, but we probably touched on some of them. Okay. But, you can go ahead. There's okay. some. Like, um, um, LaDonna V asks, can you break the intergenerational curse with someone that you love and can't live without? So, again, you know, as we said earlier, you can break those generational curses. However, Folks have to be, you see what I'm saying, willing to. You have to be willing to, not willful. See, there's a difference there. You see what I'm saying? You just willfully ignoring me. No, you have to be willing to, look, baby, I need help. You know, admitting that you need help is a strength in itself. Mm -hmm. You know, baby, I need help with this. Well, you need to go see somebody then. No, that's not the answer. You know, it's I need help. And so you let's do it. I have folks calling all the time. I have men calling. I have women calling. Mothers calling for sons. They on the phone. I need help. You know, I'm like, man, this is powerful. And so, yeah, you can create you can you can get rid of that. However, they have to want to get rid of it. If you don't want to get rid of it, you're not. Okay. And this was one I passed. Um, it, it's going back to the brain spotting. Can mm-hmm. brain spotting be used to treat depression? Okay. So I think it can. It's not typically used for depression. There are different things that are used. But however, if you're depressed due to trauma, that will come out. You see what I'm saying? In the session. So if um, like, for instance, uh, you know, like the doc that was using it for Sandy Hook. Those people are depressed and traumatized after that. You know what I'm saying? 9-11. You depressed and and traumatized after that. So specifically, you know, it works, but it's more so dealing with trauma. So for depression, you may do things like exercise. You may say, hey, get in a lighted room. You know, uh, exercise is the best thing for depression. There may be some medication. You know, I'm not a big medication pusher, you Mm -hmm. know. I'm thinking like, hey, you get out there and you start working out and you start lifting some weights and you start doing productive things and stuff like that to get beyond that. However, when you finish, you go back into that depression. So, yeah, dealing with certain things, you know, the traumatic, you know, um, events that happen. Let me deal with those. Yeah, it can help. I'm sure it can. 
Okay. Yeah, and I think you, you've answered this when I was going to ask about how can the cycles of intergenerational trauma be broken? So mm -hmm. I think I'm going to break down you just gave on those four things that kind of can bring people back, you know, that are going through those things. But what would be like a knowledge nugget, because we're on our time now, that you can leave with the viewers about, you know, seeking therapy or identifying, acknowledging when, when there is a mental health issue going on? Yeah. So um, one other thing, you know, I wanted to say, I was dealing with a young lady in uh, therapy and she was talking about her daughter who I didn't know she had. And uh, she started talking about, you know, what was going on with her daughter and blah, 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 blah. And I was like, well, how old is your daughter? And she said, she's nine. And I said, oh, OK. I said, tell me what was it like for you at nine years old? And she started talking about how she was going from, you know, parent to um, to grandparent to whatever, being told that her father was dead or didn't want to have anything to do with it. And then she found her dad. Mm -hmm. So now you have people who have lied to you that secure attachment didn't happen. All of this stuff going on. You see what I'm saying? Now, guess what? I said, and... How old is your daughter again? And she started crying because she realized, remember what she said? Hell behind, left in the brain. She passed that to her daughter. So when kids are acting up at a certain age, it's not necessarily, oh, it's teenage angst. It's terrible twos. It's this and that. Did something traumatic happen with you at that age? You see what I'm saying? So when a child is being difficult, you know, a child sometimes is acting or triggering a dormant wound in the parent that has not been resolved. It's still open. You have people who go to their graves with open wounds. So my, you know, suggestion is, hey, we all need therapy. We all need therapy. Nobody's fine. We all need therapy. And if you just still go into therapy to get a tune up, hey, I got some things going up. It's not like you're crazy. You know, like I said, there is no diagnosis called crazy. I just want to get help because there's some things I'm kind of struggling with and I prayed about it. However, you know, I need to talk to somebody right here. I need to be, you know, it's not that, okay, I'm going to sit here, Lord, I'm going to be patient and I'm going to wait on you to answer. Yeah, okay, I'm going to do that. And at the same time, the Lord is telling you, go see a therapist, you right. know, and go get help with that. So, like I said, we all need therapy. And I think just, you know, just going in and getting a tune up and saying, hey, you know, when somebody says, you know, tells me I don't need no therapist, I'd be like, you're the main one that needs it. Absolutely. You probably need it more than anybody. Right. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, Dr. Terry Parks, for being here. And if anybody is in the area and they are seeking a therapist, I have the name of his business going across the bottom scroll by. It's a new approach, behavioral health. And the um, website is also listed, anabh.org. So again, thank you all for watching today. And thank you again, Terry, for being here. I greatly appreciate it. Thank you. Hey, thanks for having me. I enjoyed it. Thank you. And um, I'll be on, I won't be on next week. I will be um, at one of my besties. Um, she's getting married, so I'll be doing that. Ooh. But the following week, yeah, some people are finding love out here. But the following <laughs> week, I will be back, and we will be talking about self-care and self-love. So join me on May the 2nd. So Thank you for watching, and don't forget to subscribe to this channel, hit the notification bell, and share and like this video. Thank you. Bye-bye.